So welcome everybody. I think you should be welcoming me because I'm here the first time and everybody else comes here all the time. So <laughs> thank you so much. It's nice to be here. I'm, I'm staying now in the BSV. Uh, sorry, in um, uh, Newbury Buddhist Monastery. I'm here to help for three months with uh, Venerable Bodhi, Bodhi Dacha, and Venerable Chunda. We were ordained together about five years ago as a monks. I've been in Bodhinyana now seven years. That's uh, a long time. So we asked Ajahn Brahm whether we can come here and help a little bit of Newbury Buddhist Monastery, which is it's nice to be here. It's nice to see a new monastery starting, a proper forest monastery here in Melbourne. I think there's a demand for that, so it's good. And especially for the having uh, monks and nuns there, it's hard to see two communities living together. There's, uh, there's, I don't think there's any monasteries really like that before, or at the moment anywhere, especially in Theravada tradition. So it's nice. We've got it going, and it's, it's going well. So please, everybody, come and see us in the monastery. So <laughs> we do come here to the city and... Uh, give talks and try to entertain, inspire people, but we do need you guys to come to the monastery, so that's, that would be great to see everybody there one, at least once, bring us some, some food and stuff. So this is, like I said, this is my first talk I ever given in public talk, so it's a bit of an interesting what's going to come out of my mouth, I don't even know. In my tradition, we don't usually prepare for these talks, so we have this kind of thing where it started with Ajahn Chah, who was the teacher of my teacher, Ajahn Brahm. And uh, Ajahn Chah had this thing where he, he looks at the monks, he, all the monks are seated there, and he starts looking down, he looks down, it's like, okay, you give a talk. And even if there are a thousand people, you know, you've been a monk for one year, you have to give a talk. When Ajahn Chah tells you, you have to give a talk. So Ajahn Brahm always said it was a bit nerving when, they, you know, Ajahn Chah starts looking down the line, who's going to give the talk? And then, he, you know, he stops at you. And there was this one monk, and there's the story goes that there was one monk, and he, he, he was actually told that he's going to give the talk next day. It was one of these big days, like a Vesak day for Buddhists, or something like that. Big ceremonies, what we have in Buddhism. And so he prepared this talk. He, he thought about it, he wrote it down, you know, maybe he had a couple of days of time to practice the talk. So he, he was prepared. He, he took all the points, you know, he was going to elaborate this thing like the Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths and he's going to, you know, have this really nice sequence. He was university uh, educated so he knew exactly how to give a talk and this and that. So, uh, but he was a bit nervous about giving the talk. So the time of the talk comes and he, you know, he go goes up to the stage, Ajahn Chah was giving him to the stage and he started to give the talk and he was he gave a one hour talk, that's the sort of the custom when we usually do the monks, 45, one hour. And after one hour he felt really good about himself, he felt really proud, of, you know, he did a good job. I've, you know, I've, I've, I did a really good talk and the people, you know, like there was just like all the monks are nodding, it's like, oh, that was really nice talk. Because what happens usually in, in Thai tradition, because we don't prepare the talks, uh, the talks tend to be all over the place. So even with Ajahn Chah, who's, you know, he's the great teacher in our tradition, he's, Ajahn, Ajahn Brahm always calls Ajahn Chah's talk, they were like digging gold. There were these little nuggets here and there, but most of the time he was just yapping around about everything, about just, he was just talking about the stuff. And, but once in a while you get these beautiful golden nuggets which inspires you and keeps you going. But Ajahn Chah's talks apparently went for four hours, five hours, six hours. And as a monk, you cannot get up, you know, like you respect your teacher, you just like, you have to go to the toilet, but you just have to sit there. But luckily, in, in these days, we don't give, so, you know, the talks are not so long, even Ajahn Brahm keeps them short, but anyways, what happened? So the monk gave, they gave the talk, and one hour is gone, so he's like preparing to leave, and it's like, oh, that was good, and he felt really proud of himself, you know, he, he was elated, he did a good job. And Ajahn Chah looks at him and says, one more hour. Uh, so it's like, okay, well, you know, I've covered everything, and this is not much to say. Well, okay, well, you know, he says, you know, there's nothing you can do. Your teacher tells you, you have to give him one more, one more hour. And so he sat down back into the seat and said, okay, he started talking. And he, he's been a monk for four years or something. He's in Thailand, in Thai, it's not his language, so he starts to struggle a little bit. So he does the second hour, and he, he felt really good. Okay, went all right, you know, people still listening, nobody's falling asleep too much. He's prepared to leave, and Ajahn Chah looks at him, one more hour. 
So now he's giving me three hours of talk. So he really starts to struggle with the talk and the uh, people start falling asleep and, you know, most people start leaving after three hours. After all, people have to go and, you know, attend their farms and this and that. You, they cannot listen to three-hour talk. And the, the monk, anyways, he ties, is not his first language, so he starts repeating himself and he starts to slur and he starts to get tired and he just keeps talking. It was like... Okay, the third hour is gone. He said, okay, that's it. I was good. And Ajahn Chah looks at him and he said, one more hour. <laughs> so by this time, it's getting close to midnight. So even the old, who, if there's any lay people in the hall, they fall fallen asleep. Because some ties are very respectful. If that, you know, a monk gives a talk, they, you know, they try to listen, but even they were so tired, they were falling asleep. Uh, all the monks were gone by this time. Ajahn Chah was the only one sitting apparently there. All the monks left, there were like dogs lying on the floor, you know, some, some people snoring in the corners, but nobody else left there. And so after giving a four-hour talk, and then he got up and then he left. And he said, after that, I never felt nervous about giving a talk. He said, you know, like Ajahn Chah gave him the teaching of, you know, don't be too arrogant and too proud of yourself. You're going to be know all these things and you're going to elaborate these beautiful Buddhist teachings and you, 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 you know it all. You, you, the, he gave him a teaching of, you know, don't be too ready. You have to be, be ease at whatever comes. So we sort of have this tradition from, from Ajahn Chah's tradition, from the Thai forest tradition, where we, we get up on the stage and we're supposed to say something. So... This is what I'm doing. <laughs> so there's all these things like um, people ask us all the time as a monk. Well, the, 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 people come to monastery all the time. You know, uh, Bodhinyana monastery is a very busy place and there's a lot of people come here. We get 100 people all the time coming. We have big days. And the monks are like information booth. Like people ask questions from the monks all the time. We're supposed to have the answers. Uh, what's the most common question people ask from the monks? They ask, where's the toilet? <laughs> no, they don't ask too much. They, they come there. That was a joke. They, the most common question we get as a monk is like, why did you become a monk? That's, we get that all the time. Even the senior monks, I've noticed, they do get that. You know, Ajahn Pramal is going to come here soon. And he's a 20-year monk. He's been a monk for 22 years, I think, now. And people ask him, well, why did you become a monk? And we all have stories, but they, we, it's sort of we make them up. <laughs> it's not there's going to be an answer that really. So we, and I've repeated myself so many times last past seven years that I've, I have this nice storyline so I can tell you the story. But the thing is, there's all these, you guys here, and like I'm looking at you, there's so many... Sri, Sri Lankans and Malay people, some here and all that, and I'm thinking, why don't you become a monk? Why don't you become a nun? You guys are born with Buddhism. I wasn't born in, Bud in a Buddhist family. I didn't know anything about Buddhism. Why did I become a monk? I think, I think that's the interesting thing, why. Um, why why people are so intrigued as well. Why, why did uh, me as a monk, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not even an Aussie, I'm, I'm from Finland, and people might have guessed from my accent, I have a bit of an accent, funny American uh, accent, and um, I come from a really remote part of Finland. Part of why I'm, I'm saying this, my mom and dad, they want to watch this video, and my uncles and aunties, so I have to, it's like my mom was asking, why don't you talk about something about Finland? So I was like, okay, I have to incorporate this thing. And so this is going to be a, sort of like a basics of Buddhism. I'm trying to incorporate like the basics of Buddhism into, into my path. So why did I become a monk? And why none of you have been a monk yet or none? That's the question. I was intrigued by the Buddhism because there was something in me which wasn't truly satisfied with life. In Buddhism, we have this um, concept which is called Nibbida. And the Nibbida is the Pali word, and it means that you sort of repelled from the world. You, you don't really believe, you know, this, you don't think there's 
substance to the world that you want to you wanna live like everybody else. You don't want to do the normal thing. I did all of that stuff. I did go to school. I did, did my military service. We have to do that. And I even thinking of becoming a work in the military. Uh, I did a lot of schooling. I, actually, I didn't even finish my last degree because I'm so, I'm, I was rushing to become a monk. <laughs> what happened at the end, I was, I, I, it was my third degree, I think. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I've, I've seen enough. So I had this thing which we call the Nibida, where you, you, the world sort of like, you are repelled by what you see in the world. So that was the final push. But where it started is, I come from, like I said, I come from quite a remote place in Finland. My, my whole village consists of about 200 people. My mom and dad still live. My brother lives there still. Uh, my sister is actually there as well now. Um, and there's absolutely no Buddhism. That was the time before the internet, so there was no way for me to get in contact with Buddhism. So sometimes I hear these stories about why people want to, they make this marriage. So may I be born next lifetime in a family, Buddhist family, and maybe you get contact with the Dhamma. Maybe you will be, m maybe you somehow, you know, like you can predict your pre next life and, you know, create a lot of karma so you get, reborn, you get reborn in this Buddhist family. But it doesn't seem to work that way. Like I said, I look at you guys, a lot of you, like, you are interested in the, the Buddhism, and you, you know, you love it, and we, we do all get inspired, but it, it, that's not a prerequisite for being a, really into the Buddhist way of teaching, the, the Dhamma, the, what, we, what we call the truth. The thing is what we have to get, we have to hear this beautiful teaching from others, so that's why we have us as a monks, and we, we and that's why you have to start the training hopefully early. Hopefully you, my, my dad was asking, why did you become a monk, you know, when I die? So, you know, why do you have to become a monk now? You're still young. And, that, and it's sort of a good idea, but you know, when you retire, then you've done everything and you, you know, then you become a monk. But if you want to train yourself, you know, you have to start early. It's like anything in life. It takes time to, Buddhism is simple. Buddhism is simple. It's all about feeling. How do you feel inside? Mindfulness, loving kindness, these are things. It's not difficult. But to train yourself into that, it takes a long time. And there's this beautiful simile of the, in Buddhism where Buddha said there's like a, it's like a tree. And if it's leaning in a certain direction in the forest, it's going to fall that way. So if you, especially if you're a Buddhist where, you know, like you, you're just a Vesak Buddhist, what we call the Vesak Buddhist, you go, in Christ, Christianity you, live, you go to church once a year. In Vesak Buddhism we call the in temple once a year, so you go to the Vesak ceremony. And we do see a lot of people like that. So those are the, you know, the, the Buddhists, but, you, you know, sort of, you're like a tree. You, you, you're in the forest, but it's standing straight up. So when the tree is going to fall, which way it's going to fall? You just, you just don't know. So we have to keep leaning the tree in a certain direction. Set our training in a certain direction. And then we're going to fall into that direction where, the, uh, where, the, where you're pointing. So that's why, for me, I felt that I have to get into this being a monk earlier. I cannot wait too long. But the beginning was, of course, that I seem to be going back to that. I, I kind of get started. So uh, the, the starting point was like, I'm just a normal kid, raised up in a normal family. You ca I did not find any Buddhist anywhere and all that, but I just didn't feel that the normal concepts of like everybody, you go to school and you, you get a job and you get a family, it didn't seem to apply to me too well. But I mean, that was the norm. That's everybody does that. I mean, that's uh, that's what life, every everyday life, is all about. So I, I I 
I went to the schooling system and uh, tried everything, things, and then because I'm from that really small place where there's only 200 people in my village, my whole school was about 15 kids, first six grades. There was only 15 kids in my whole class, whole school actually, not a classroom. There was only three of us in my, my, my grade. So it's, it's a small place where I come from. So I always felt that I need to go somewhere big. I, you know, the life is out there. It's somewhere there. I, I'm going to find it. Maybe it's not going to happen here. So it'll, maybe it happens somewhere else. So I was always aiming towards something in life where it's going to be. Life is somewhere else. Now, I was going to determine to find that place. You know, the, the happiness is somewhere else, or the uh, li things happen somewhere else. It's not here, but I'll, I'll find it. So I, I, I said to look, look it up, the life, the, the place where everything is happening and where, where it's going to be interesting. And uh, maybe I find a place where I belong. So um, I, uh, I studied, I, w I lived in Spain, then I moved to the United States. That was already when I was doing my university. I lived in San Francisco, and then I said, okay, I'm going to move to New York. New York is the, definitely the biggest place where I can, I can find now. And if anything, you know, they say this, this if, you know, you can find it in New York. Anything you want to, basically, good or bad. So I moved there, and just before I moved there, I read this book about this um, young fellow and he was going into a bit of, he was a bit of a misfit. But he was like, uh, like a lot of you people, uh, he was born in a Buddhist family. His mom and dad actually are Buddhist meditation teachers. And, and, but he was repelled by, he didn't like it. He thought it was too airy-fairy Buddhism. We have this kind of thing where it's, you know, loving kindness. And this is, when you're a teenage boy, it doesn't really, ring the bell sometimes. It's, it's a bit too pink. Uh, so he was repelled by this um, pinkness of Buddhism where it, it didn't fit, seem to fit him. Uh, so he, he, he was a, he's a punk guy and he got into drugs and this and that. He ended up in prison. And then while he was in, in, uh, incarcerated, he said, well, if there's anything to this teaching, my mom and dad are teaching the meditation. Not so much Buddhism, just the meditation of mindfulness. He said, I'll give it a go. So he was sitting in his cell last first night after the door's been locked. And, and it's not a nice place to be because I teach in prison and I know the, what the guys are feel like. It's apparently a pretty horrible feeling the first night when the, they lock the door and you just know you cannot open it, go somewhere. So he, he, that was, he, he felt, so he, he tried the meditation. And the first time he felt, he felt that he was, he looked inside what's in his mind. And he saw that there's still kindness inside of him. There's still peace inside him. No matter what of the outside circumstances in, in life, there was still calm and peace inside and where he could always access. And he felt, all right, I, I give this a go. I, I tried the where the thing where I was rebel and uh, trying all these things where a lot of young people try. He said, well, that was, an, you know, that was like cul-de-sac. That was the end. There's no way I cannot take it any further. So he sees, you know, he felt that the peace was compelling. That was, it's so sweet. The peace you find inside of you, if you really can look at beautifully, like look, kindly towards your, your mind. There's this beautiful peace there, which is always with you. So he wrote the book. And I read the book then, a couple years later. And I was moving to New York. And I, I was inspired by his story. And of course, I always felt Buddhism, but I was reading all these Buddhist books, and to tell you the truth, a lot of them are pretty boring. Um, I mean, I do love the stories now. I've been in monk, you know, in the monastery for seven years, so I, I do appreciate the Buddhist teachings. You know, I regard them very highly. But as a layperson, I was reading all kind of Buddhist books, and oh boy, they, 
very dry, they're very philosophical, they're very esoteric, and you just don't know the tale from the, the beginning. It's like, where should I start? Which tradition should I take? That was the first question I wanted. I, I really wanted to be a Buddhist, but I just like, where do I start? What's like, I read the Tibetan stuff, and I, I, I read some of the Zen stuff, and I, and I was looking, I was looking, and then I, I got this book in my hand, and was like, okay, maybe Buddhism is all, you know, that's cool. Buddhism is all about mindfulness and meditation. So I said, all right, that, you know, and there's some cool kids doing it, so, you know, there must be something to it, you know, like, okay, so I'm, I'm happy, I found something. I felt like I wanted to be a Buddhist, and there was something for me. So that's good. So I, I moved to New York and I started to look around like, what's the, what now? And I, I, I read this book and I looked online and there was just this same guy was teaching meditation two blocks away from me. So I was like, oh, it's a sign from the universe. <laughs> so I started to go to that meditation class all the time. And it was really nice because there was like all these, I was sort of uh, leaning towards way where I was like a uh, punk you know, very, uh, sort of like a tough guy. I'm not anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm taught so long in the monastery. I'm, I'm now the soft guy. And I'm, uh, I'm, my plan is I'm going to get softer and softer. I'm going to be the, try to be the, as kind as I can. That's my goal now. I thought I was going to be a rebel, but now my goal is going to be this kind of soft as I can. So I met, you know, I was sitting with a lot of these guys and, you know, guys and girls, and they were like a lot of Mohawks. Even the Buddha statue we had, instead of like this, we had a Buddha statue with the Mohawk in the, in the front of, you know, Mohawk is the one where you have this big hair. Too. And it was really cool, but, and, and I felt really home, and I really felt that it was like, wow, this is, I, I really appreciate this kind of Buddhism. And I, I really enjoyed the meditation. It was, it was, I remember the first time, I was, it was really painful, I have to admit it. I never used to sit on the floor, and it, was, it's, it has taken me a long time to get comfortable to sit like this. And that was about 15 years ago. And I was, but I remember the first time we were sitting, we went to the meditation hall. And there was, I think it was this, the guy who was, who was my teacher, and he was, he was teaching the meditation. He was, we do this body scanning. My, lo, a lot of us are used to this kind of body scanning. It's, it's very good practice, actually. Even if normal day life, you, you're busy and all that, you just go back to your body, and you see what's, in, what's happening in your body. Your body is always a good place to, it's sort of like a pH meter on the water where it tells you where the problem lies. There's always, your body tells this nuts and places in your body. So we're doing this body scanning meditation and it was nice, but I was like, well, quite painful. And so I look into pain, look into pain. And then about half an hour late, you know, into the meditation, he says, okay, now go to your breath. And I, I look at my breath and I was like, that's the first time I looked into my breath. I was 25 years old and I was like, I never seen my breath before. It's amazing. I lived so long, and there was this thing with me all this time. I didn't know it was, I had it. I didn't. It was. It was with me all the time. And I, and I felt I could access this kind of thing, which I. There was this thing. Where I felt almost like it was coming from somewhere deep down in my past. That, I'd done this before. I'm not saying I can remember my past lives or anything, but I felt that there was, I felt very familiar with it. I felt very, this sounds right, this feels right. It's like Ajahn Brahm is teaching us in the Bodhinyana Monastery. And we're sitting there, especially during the rainy, se rainy season retreat when we do the three months retreat, and you're sitting there in the hall, we have the di lights are dimmed, and Ajahn Brahm talks, and a lot of you people now listen to Ajahn Brahm, his talks are, he's an amazing talker, uh, you know, I have to give it to him. If anything, you know, Buddha praised about having um, supernatural skills, like, you know, walking through the walls, or walking in the air. But the one skill he praised was teaching a Dhamma. He said all this rest of the stuff, you know, like walking on water, it, it, yeah, it must be useful if there's not a bridge. But um, more than that, he never braced 
he never said, you know, that's a good thing to have. He says, a good skill to have, it's, all, like a, it's almost, it, it is a supernatural skill to teach Dhamma beautifully, to teach people who, so they get inspired. So if anything, I can see Ajahn Brahm having that skill. Uh, so I felt, because of that breath, there was something which inspired me, something I could access somewhere in the past where I felt, this is amazing. This is, there's something to this thing. And okay, you know, how Buddhist is, to, is that kind of thing where you just look in your breath, meditation, how, how, why, what's the concept of Buddhism there? Why, you know, but that's the beginning. That sort of, you know, draws us in into this kind of what we call Buddhism and, and Dhamma and this and that. And that's the core of Buddhism. It's the meditation, and sometimes we, we tend to forget that. That's where we have to find the inspiration, and that's where we find all these answers into life. It's, uh, I mean, the monks, as monks, we, we, we keep the, the teachings going. We try to inspire people. This is entertainment, this thing. Why are the monks here giving a talk Saturdays, and monks and nuns? We try to entertain and inspire people to keep going. You're doing a good job, yeah, it's going well. But more than that, it's, you have to do it yourself. So you have to do the uh, uh, meditation for yourself, and you have to get enlightened by yourself, <laughs> unfortunately. The monks and nuns, and the Buddha, Buddha started it, of course. But he was the, you know, so he was the starting point. And that was for me the starting point of the getting into why I became a monk. I started meditation, and there's a big thing now in mindfulness, and that's the mindfulness meditation, all that. And that's the only thing I'm, I think is lacking, which I took. The next step was to start doing, started getting interesting on the Dhamma, the Buddha's teachings. Mindfulness is, of course, good. As Buddhist monks and Buddhist people, we don't mind. It's sort of taken from us. We've been teaching that for two and a half thousand years and now it's this kind of corporate thing and we don't mind. You know, it's, if it helps people that's good. But the next, level, next step is sort of for us, all of us, is to get interested of well, what are the Buddhist teachings? And that was for me the thing where I, I started to get interested. And I still was struggling with these boring books. And we have beautiful scholars like Bhikkhu Bodhi, but a lot of his stuff is very, very, very scholastic. But then Ajahn Brahm wrote his first book, The Open and Door Your Heart, and I felt, okay, I, now I can start understanding what Buddhism is. And I started listening to his talks, and there was this, Ajahn Brahm mentions quite, a, quite often that why don't you become a monk? Why, what's keeping you in the world? And I, uh, it was for me, that was, it's like, wow, that's an, there's an option. You can become a monk, you can become a nun. And I thought it was like, wow, I have to try that. It took me quite a few years after that. I was, that was time I was 25, and then I was 30 years old when I got to monastery first time. Actually 29, but then I ordained when I was 30. And I, I felt like, okay, I'm going to give it a try. Um, after seven years, I'm still trying. But I know it takes time. Buddhism, it's all about the feeling. We all know. We cannot just go to Buddhist temple and get our sins forgiven. We, give, we take the precepts, we try to follow them to the best to our ability, but they're not... They're not set of rules. We, we take these precepts of like, try and avoid false speech because we know that's gonna give us happiness. We know that people trust us because we are trust for the people. So we, it makes our life easier. That's why we take these precepts. And that's why we, that's the next step. So for me, uh, I took the five precepts that, you know, take longer and longer, and then now I have now a lot of precepts, which it's good for the monks because uh, it makes us even more free because we cannot use money, we cannot cook, this and that. So we're really free. 
a lot of people think like, why well, you, you know, you have all those precepts, isn't it very limiting? No, it is limiting, but it, it frees us from a lot of stuff. So anything in life you can let go to, you don't, have, you don't carry it around too many things, not just material things, but in, in life you, we carry all these emotions and um, stories from our past. And more, more and more you can let go, the freer you become. And those are the great teachings of the Buddha where I felt like there's something to this. When, when I started hearing about Buddhist teachings about this, uh, I, everything is impermanent. Nothing is in this world is impermanent. It's a bit difficult to argue with that with somebody like a Christian where they say, well, there's a soul and all that. How can you, not, how can you prove it's not permanent? But I'm not going to go there because it's a long, winding discussion. But uh, basically, as a Buddhist, we believe this. Nothing is constant. Even if you die, we might go to heaven. If, if you want to go to heaven, sure. You know, you can go there. It's your, yourself who takes you there. If you, but it's not going to be permanent, unfortunately. It's not a happy ever after place. Uh, and because of the impermanence, there's, uh, everything is suffering. Everything is changing. And the more you cling into these kind of impermanent things, the more we're going to suffer. And I started hearing these teachings, I was like, it, it does make sense. And because of that impermanent, impermanence, because of its suffering, they cannot be self. How can you have self somewhere there where it's constantly changing? How can you have some, some self there which is, if it's going to be suffering, how would, why would you hold into that? Even your mind, if it's suffering, why would you hold into something which is really suffering? No, you would automatically just, you, our minds are determined, we want to go somewhere which is happiness. We always, we, that's why we do, we, we have these choices. We always choose something which is, we think it's going to make us happy, which is going to lessen the suffering. So because of these things, I I took this long, it took me a long time, but s relatively short. I mean, I'm st still, I, I managed to ordain when I was still, uh, I didn't have too many gray, gray hairs, and I managed to ordain before I managed to get sucked into having a family. Families are beautiful. It's, I mean, I have a beautiful family. I have to be grateful. They, um, they weren't too happy about me ordaining, and they're still maybe not 100% sure, but... I've, I've taken them two times to Bodhinyana, my, my mom and dad, and they, they do see the value of me being a monk, and um, all you guys supporting us as monks and nuns. We have this beautiful thing in Theravada Buddhism where monks and nuns, we're not just some separate entity living in a forest, hermits, where we are part of the community. And that's why we have to come here and teach you guys. And that's why you guys have to feed us. <laughs> and so we try to, we keep each other going. Without lay people, there's no Buddhism. Without monks, there is no Buddhism. We need both. We need both sides. So thank you for that. I, I must thank you all of you for supporting us. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I think I have a little bit of time if somebody wants to ask a question. The toilet's behind the corner, by the way. <laughs> <laughs>